start today's class just with a quick review of our software. For those of you that haven't used R before, um, you might see it here on the side. We'd like to give it a try. Um, if you've chosen to use another software package, remember we said at the start of this course there's no need to use R. But if you feel to, uh, that we can find it, there's a full tutorial on the course website. What I'll do is I'll just quickly walk through some four pointers of that installation and use of R. So what I'm referring to on the website is of course, if you click on the software tutorial, there's um, a breakdown of the many steps over here that will lead through the process of using R. So uh, you can download and install it according to those first few instructions. And for this first assignment, uh, steps one to 13 apply. Okay, so each one of these doesn't take more than five minutes to follow. It's very, very short for the one. But uh, you should be able to get to step 13 and that's done for the first assignment. Now, I will let you install it on the other side, but once you get up to running, the will be on the Mac, it goes. It will look something like this. So there's two parts to the software. There's R and there's R Studio. R Studio is a pretty front end to R, which is simply just a text and text type device. Okay, so if you're used to map that, you see that font similar to this. That's R. It's waiting there for your command. But R Studio gives you a little bit of a workspace to, to work with your code. Okay, so the way R Studio works, so that the thing behind it that you should follow is you're trying to copy up in the top left side. And then you execute that code, and it will copy and paste it down here automatically for you in the R environment. Any variables that you create will show up there in the top right, and any plots will show up here in the bottom. Then if you look at that, if you type up here and say your desired process is to go file new and start an R script, and it will create an empty window for you to type in commands. So if you might type in your first command A is equal to 4, 5. And that might be your first assignment. And you can then have B is equal to 3. And then you can run that active document. So if you click that button over there, it will copy and paste those commands from there as if you had typed it by hand. Now this is obviously trivial in this example, even though I would have simply just typed those two in there directly. But the purpose of statistical thinking is that you save this document up here, something demo.r or whatever the name of your file is, so you can save it and then run it in the future. Share it with a colleague, show it to your boss that you've done the work. Two years later, you wonder how the heck did you get this result? Well, you save the document and you can figure it out up here. So you create a document of the full process. And then instead of just copying and pasting it down to the software, you will automatically click on that source file. So then you can go, maybe perhaps your next line might be A times B. And you just click the source file and then all that run it. So the, these are obviously trivial type type commands. So what I've loaded here is a demo file, and I'll post this to the course website. The demo file will show you some of the basics of our capability. So this mathematical these are all very, very common. We've all used MathMath by one go through this sort of trivial type of um, notation. Suffice it to say that the only one that might be able to interest you is the, the raise to the power. That's I expect most of you have seen that sort of notation. There's logs, and so forth. Logs to the base 10, log to base anything that you like. You can add it as a second variable. Now this might be new to you. If you've used Python, you're used to that sort of notation. You say log, and you can give it an input. In MATLAB, you're used to just giving it inputs, you know, the first input, the second input, and so forth. But in PMR, you can say base equals. So you're telling the software what that second input is. You're telling them what the base is. And in fact, you can abbreviate it as well. So here it's abbreviated to simply B equals. So as long as there's no input input the name that the input would be, you can reduce it down to something a little shorter, if you prefer. But generally, we'll use the full name. 
If you don't know how to use the log function, you can type help log. So down here you type help log, and it will then throw up down here that help file. So the bottom right hand side is a flexible window that will show plots. It will show help as well. So if you go read down in the log file documentation, there you can see what the inputs are there. There's also, if you type log, when we get open brackets and then tab, it will present it to you in line. So you don't even have to type help. So simply as you, you know the command you want to use, you just forgot the exact syntax, help open, uh, sorry, type command, open brackets, tab, and then it will present this little window to you to prompt you. Okay? And as I said, they press F1 for additional help. Okay, so it's a, R Studio is a way to help you write your R code a whole lot faster than you would otherwise. Uh, we can also deal with vectors. The only difference is when we create a vector in R, we use the combine function, which is abbreviated down to just a single letter C. So C will combine elements, or use of C will combine objects together. So here I'm combining objects, one, two, three, four. If I run that single line, Okay, so notice what I can do here in R Studio as well. If I select just a single line, I can then click that icon over there and it will run just that, that row for me. So you don't have to run your entire script. If I just want to run that line, click on that link, that I've created a new vector, one, two, three, four. We can also create vectors using the colon operator or the sequence operator. So, sequence of numbers. Let's say you want to create numbers 2, 4, 6, 8. So start at 2, end at 8, step or so 2, and it will then create a vector. Um, so as I said, I'll post this all to the course website. You can go try try this out at any time. What I'm more interested in showing you today is particularly how to load data sets into R. So if you're comfortable loading data files into Excel by like file open. How do you do that in R? Well, R we use the read.csv function. So it will read a CSV file for you. And the nice thing about R is that you can read directly from the website where the data sets are. So if you can give it a URL, it will go to that URL, fetch the data, and return it back as a numerical. How do I know which URL to use? Well, I give it to you in the assignments, but if you go to the data sets website, um, let's take a look at this data set website. You go there, and I've told you in this particular assignment to use this data set called Systematic Method. <coughs> you can click on that link, and it will give you a bit of a description about the data set. Or you can also use that CSV link over here to simply download the data file. So if you right click on that link, CSV, say copy link address. There's the URL for the file. It's the copy link address. And now that I have that link address, if I come to our studio, if I just paste it in over there, there's the full address given to me. But just wrap that around into a read.csv function, single quotes to tell it that it's a file name or a, a, a string. And as is, that's just going to load the data file but not assign it to any variable. So let's assign it to a variable as well. And that's what I did up here in fact, this, this line. So batch.web. Read the batch data file with the read.csv function, fetching the data from that web address. So if we execute that line, um, we'll get a batch.web variable. So notice up here, my workspace in the top right hand side, there's a new variable there called batch.web, 300 rows. Link to the file.csv 
file name, and Windows users, you also use the slashes that lie in this forward direction. Okay, so Windows users are typically comfortable with using slashes in the opposite way, not in R. In R, if you're loading your file from your hard drive, you still slash this way. There's a reason for it, because R files are meant to be interchanged between Windows users, Linux users, Mac users, so you write your file once, you can give it to anyone, doesn't matter what type of computer they are, and you load it. So the convention that R has chosen is to slash the direction. Windows, Mac, all the Okay, so you can read from the web, you can read from your library. No matter what you do, either option, you will get, you get your variable loaded. And the very first thing after you've loaded a variable is to use the summary command. So, now I've got a variable loaded there from my hard drive. Always, always, without fail, the first step is to do the summary on that one. So match.htb in this case. And here this variable has got a single column. The column's name is yield, and it will tell me, give me that five number summary we spoke about last week. Remember we were speaking about box plots and the five minute summary. Except it will add give you a six. It will give you the median and the median. So you can see both. But otherwise it will give you the minimum and max, first quartile, third quartile, and the median and the median. If you load a variable with two columns, you get two summary columns side by side. Histograms on that. Now, the histogram, you have to be careful here. The batch at the moment, as, as it is, you just see summary batch. Batch is the data. If I move this over here to the top, just be clear, batch is a data set with one column called yield. If you want to plot a histogram on that, you cannot say hist batch. Says must be numeric. Well, what's going on here? Well, you, you have to type the name of the column, even if there is only one column in that file, in that variable. So batch yield, and then I'll get my list. R also has a variety of libraries. This would be the MATLAB equivalent you call toolboxes. When you use MATLAB, you may have used some other toolboxes. R has what we are called libraries that are functionally the same thing. And you can download the libraries for free um, <coughs> here from, from this menu. So install packages or libraries as it's also called. And then we can, you need to keep them up to date. So periodically libraries will update themselves. So check for package updates. It will go to the web and search for updates. And here in my case, I have four updates. Every, every so often, just keep your R libraries We will use the CAR library, so download and install that library, CAR, C-A-R. Um, it's got some very useful functions, one of which I've asked you to use in the first assignment, the scatter part.
Okay, so this next section is about variability, and it's in fact a quick review of what you learned in your stats prerequisite course. Uh, most of you took stats 2y or 3y, and you learned maybe in painstaking detail about distributions. A lot of theoretical stuff and derivations, and you may not have understood the engineering significance of those distributions. So this class is going to look at some of that and get us up to speed. And then we'll quickly move into the central limit theorem and confidence intervals. And finally, we'll end with the hints and pair tests. So it's a quick recap, in fact, of, of the prior sessions. So it might seem a little bit boring <coughs> that we're only looking at a single variable at a time, but many of you have asked in, your, in that first section, I want to know how to deal with large data sets. Now, large data sets are not just large because they've got many columns. They're also large because they've got many rows. So it works both ways. The hardest problem is to deal with many columns. Now, fortunately, we don't face that problem in engineering too much. But we do face many rows. And luckily for us, many rows are easy to deal with. If you've got 10 rows or 500 rows or 5 million rows, you can deal with it quite easily by using parallel computers. You just let different computers work with different sections of the data set and then you combine your answers together. So large data sets are actually remarkably easy to work with. When we're dealing with them though, we have to understand what we're doing. And that's what this section is about. It's summarizing large data sets down to small numbers. So for example, if your code says I've got the yields, 1,200, this is not a lot of data. So data for the past three years, what sort of distribution did this data have? You quickly find that distribution using software instruments. But then like, your colleague says, you know what, yesterday we had a yield of 160 grams per liter. This is really low. What are the chances of that occurring? Well, what, what is your colleague asking? They're asking what's the probability of this occurring. If we've got a large data set of three years, we can go look back at those data and find what is the probability that we get a value of 160 grams or less? Okay, so if that probability is very low, then we may not even bother about this problem because it's, it's happened so infrequently. But if this happens commonly, then we can actually spend some time in it. So we're going to learn how to judge those in uh, today's class and next class. If we look at historical failure data, we can then calculate probabilities in a similar manner. Know what the rate of pump scale has, what is the probability that it will have three pump rates as well? This next one is really interesting. Does reactor one have better purity than reactor two, even though the two might be identical? This, this happens in many situations with companies with 15 reactors side by side. Any polymer company you work, walk into will have multiple polymer water plates side by side, multiple extruders side by side. Does one unit behave better than the other? Or another way you can use a similar type of question is, if you make a small change to the process, has it statistically improved it? There's a question on the assignment. If you use the systematic method in 4M separations course to answer open-ended problems, does it statistically improve your grade or not? So plot those data in assignment one, you're going to see overlapping histograms and overlapping lines of plots. We're going to answer in two, three classes from now whether that's a statistically significant improvement or not. Okay, so we want to know when, when we make changes whether they've actually had an effect, if they're doing something useful for us. And then finally, this last question might seem a little bit contrived, but we can often ask instead of the mean, of the median, of the minimum and the maximum, we can often ask what is the confidence interval for a variable. I'll show you a few classes from now that that's a far more informative way of summarizing data for the confidence interval. It gives us a good engineering idea of that data location and spread. Now if you want to go back and see other notes in this, you can go look at my notes in the textbook as prescribed. You can go look at box number in chapter two. 
any Wikipedia article that will talk about a statistical concept is usually extremely well written. Okay? And should be one of the first places you go to if you're stuck on something. Uh, otherwise, any of these basic textbooks, uh, there's hundreds of them in the library that you can refer to. But uh, the Wikipedia articles are beautifully illustrated. People have actually spent a lot of time putting good, good descriptions on the statistical concepts. By the end of this six classes on this topic, you should be able to look back at every one of these terms and be able to very quickly know what they are without having to reference them up in some book. So you should be able to very quickly be able to say, after well, today's class, for example, what is the relative frequency of this degree for you? Three classes from now, what does independence mean? Why is independence important? What is confidence? What is the median? That's something you might be able to answer. So come back to this list yet again and see if you can do that. Now, the reason why we study this, this section, in fact, this entire course is useful, is because life does not begin like that. The only time life begins like that is if you're dead. And there's no signal on that heart rate monitor. But as long as you're alive, you're facing variability. Okay? Every single thing you encounter in your life is because of variability. Life did have no variability. We would not have jobs actually as engineers. Chemical engineers would really probably not be employed if it were not for variability. Okay, so we rely on the fact that life does not follow a beautiful flat line. We love it to have that if possible, but it never will. So we have to deal with the variation. And we then have to understand how to describe that variation. So that's what today's class is about. And that variation is due to some very obvious forms and sources. The first of which is simply just error. Here we're trying to measure something that has a mean of 1,680. But if we go to actually measure this variable, this is back to the thickness of those wooden boards I showed you before. This is actual data from that. That data shows this sort of variation. Sequential boards ideally should all have 1,680 thickness, but they don't. So there's just simple measurement error in our system that we cannot describe. If we look back a little bit more in the data set, we find periods of time which shows variability. We may find drift in our process. So it is drift down and then drifts back up again. This is natural drift over time occurring. And it often happens simply because of fouling, contamination in our system, slow changes over time that occur. And we'll see this sort of slow moving drift happen in our data system. This is probably one of the most or similar if you go to any data set from a company or look something like this. For a very well controlled variable, this is actually what you will see. This is a pretty good example of a great ideal type of variable. There's a little bit of noise, there's a bit of drift, but on the whole it's operating fairly well. Um, what you will often see more realistically though, and even this I argue is not quite realistic enough, there'll be periods of time when you get these dead spots. So some have turned the sensor off and it's just got a flat line, or it may actually in fact jump to zero and then jump back up again and someone turns it back on. You'll get these spikes and then the feedback control system the same, it tries to get it back to target. Uh, someone's gone and changed, in this case it was the blades of the saw, it changed that, and then slowly the feedback control system brings it back up into control. So we see that's the first point of behavior. Uh, disturbance may have impacted the process, you may have had a rock come in in the saw blades and then slightly knocked it open as well. So that's far more realistic as you see these sudden changes, sudden problems occurring in the data set, and then the corrections being made by the process to get it back into control. And this is why we have jobs, because these things occur. If this didn't occur, uh, we, we would be very lucky, and most of us actually wouldn't need to be employed. So we 
we, we're happy that this happens in some way, but we would like to be able to describe and talk about it. Now, we don't like variability. Okay? As I said before, even though we strive and really would love this in our lives, okay, why do we like that? Well, because this variability causes all sorts of problems for us. One of the most extreme forms of variability is variability that makes the product totally unusable for the customer. Think of the last time you brought, bought bread or milk from the grocery store and the bread was mold. Has that happened? Once or twice maybe, right? It doesn't happen too often here in Canada. Maybe what's our milk? Or you buy milk and two days later it's sour and you're so mad, right? You spent all that money and now that milk has gone bad. You cannot use it. But you bought, bought a product that's contaminated in some way. Buy oil from your supplier, put it into your engine or your pump, and that pump fails because it's the wrong oil. Someone's mislabeled it or the viscosity is in the wrong viscosity. So these are catastrophic problems that we don't like because of that, that this is extreme variability away from where we want. What more likely to happen is the second category is you just simply get good performance. So in a chemical process, you put in a raw material. If that raw material has high degree of variability, some days you need to use a lot of energy to process that material. Other days you need to use less material. And you don't understand what the hell is going on. Okay? You're buying this material, let's say from BASF, from some polymer company, and some days you have to put in so much energy just to melt the stuff. Their variability in their process has caused you problems. So we don't like that. We don't want to have that on our customer's side. Okay, and another example might be you buy a catalyst that's not quite right, and so your reaction times then instead of being one hour and 20 minutes, one hour, an hour and 20 minutes, and that 20 minutes away is causing you lost production. So if you're going to give this product to your customer, they're going to get pretty mad. And they may eventually, and they will actually end up walking away from you, find someone else. So many, um, many of the customers I've worked with on data and quality problems, that has been their primary reason why they've started to understand what's going on. It's because they're losing money and their customers walk away. Um, so there's all sorts of issues that you may have heard of over the past four or five years um, that problems have occurred with human variability. So you can look up some of those case studies if you want time. But there's another reason. We're not, we're not just concerned about making our customers upset. If we have a process in my clients or where you're working that doesn't have smooth operation, you want that smooth operation, and if you don't have that, you're causing two other problems for yourself. The first is that product, you're going to have to inspect it. So you're producing this product, it needs to have no contamination. If you're producing product with contamination, you're going to have to hire people to manually separate contaminated from uncontaminated products. So that inspection is going to cost you money. Or you may decide, you know what, this material is so contaminated with variability, I cannot inspect it all, so you're going to just simply dump it. Dispose of it, you may sell it, pay customers 80% sale on this crappy product, and try and get rid of it that way and not make any money off it. So variability will always cost you in some way. You're either going to lose your customers, you're going to have to sell the product at a loss, or you're going to have to inspect out the so this is, the pharmaceutical industry does this a lot. Kind of inspect quality into their product by spending huge quantities of money to, to check the product. The lumber industry is another one of those. At the end of every sawmill, there's a guy checking the boards with defects. Okay, that's inefficient. You know, the lumber industry has to have that because they cannot control the things coming. But many other processes, we have good control of our process that we want to keep it stable. This section is all about variability and stability. Now, 
one other way you can see that is if you had your process running with no feedback control, I was showing this slide to my three key students yesterday, uh, on the last week Friday. If you had a process running with no process control, you have all this variability in your raw materials. We cannot get raw materials that have no variability. We have to have variability in that raw material. We have to accept it, I should say. And if you put that into your process, you're going to get products with variability. That's if you run a process with no feedback control. Now, we recognize, of course, that we don't want this. We don't want to sell products that have highly variable outputs. So what we do is we put a feedback control loop on here. And this is what's interesting about feedback control. If you took three p earlier, you may not have realized this, but all that a feedback control system does is it injects variability into a process. What I just said, that actually sounds bad. Why would you voluntarily go insert or inject variability into your process? You go do that to counteract the variation that you see again. So you inject variability on purpose so that you get a good quality product and counteract the natural variation. That's the, one of the main reasons why we apply feedback control. Okay. And the reason why we inject this variability here is because this variability is usually variability we don't care about. This is the variability of I'm opening the heat exchanger valve 10%, 15%, 8%, 90%. We don't really care what the heat exchanger's variability is, as long as the product is being produced at a constant temperature. So that's all that feedback control is. Okay. okay, so as I said here, this whole course is on variability. We looked last week at how to visualize variability. This class is how to quantify variability. Next section, we'll look at how variability in one variable affects another. In other words, linear regression. The next section, design experiments. The whole purpose of a DOE is to introduce variability so that you can understand what the system is doing. So you introduce variability so you get cause and then you observe the effect. So the cause and effect is necessary for improvement. The final section of the course that we spend some is looking at ways to track variability. And then the final, if we get a chance, I hope we have one or two hours where I can just look at multiple sources of variation in many variables. So let's take a look at how we deal with variability. If we deal with variability, we want to summarize it. So many, many rows, as I said, we want to summarize it down by just a few plots. Numbers. Well, the most common one that you've seen is the histogram. You've seen this in probably in grade 7 or maybe you've seen histograms, if not earlier. In school, you see histograms. Here's a histogram showing uh, the gender ratio of children born in Hamilton. And as it should be by nature, we always get a few males born more than females. That's a statistical phenomenon that's observed in most populations. That's, that's more, quite normal. The next one that you see is a histogram for continuous variables. So binary variables or categorical variables of this type, you plot male, female. Those are your two categories. If you are plotting say, level of education, you may have high school, college, university, PhD. Then you've got four categories, one bar per category. If you have a categorical variable, it's very easy to see what your bars are. If you have a continuous variable, you simply create your own bars, create your own categories. So arbitrarily decide, I'm going to create, I don't know, 20 bins here, and just simply use those as my categories. So we like to then generate these histograms, and R will, has an algorithm to automatically calculate what the optimal number of bins should be to present your data in a good way. If you want, you can force R to use a different number I have a pretty good algorithm to automatically find how many bits it should use. So you type hist, open brackets, and the name of the variable, you usually get a very good plot. Okay. Type help hist to see how you can force R to use the number of bits. Okay, so what I'd like you to do is think about these case studies, work with someone next to you, and draw an histogram of these five examples, 
be a histogram of the numbers from the six side dice. What does the histogram look like for lab measurements that you need to measure G? What would the grades look like for a residency test? Annual income in Canada and the histogram of bacterial count, number of bacteria per cubic inch of meats that you buy. Yeah. 
Oh, maybe that's what short change. Okay, so every university I know of tends to do these experiments in first year physics where you calculate theoretically what G is. And then you should look at everyone's lab reports and you look at the calculated value of G, what should you see? What type of distribution would you see? Same as the dice, but more where between the lower bounds and upper bounds. Normal distribution with a mean at nine point eight one. Okay. Narrow distribution. Narrow distribution. Okay. So your MIT physics students who have narrow distribution using crappy equipment. 9.81 broad distribution. Maybe someone who's doing this, done this many times and they've got a very careful experimental technique, their distribution might be a little bit more narrower. But you should find a tendency that most people will be above or below or at 9.81 most of the time. And the broadness of that distribution or narrowness is probably a function of their experimental error, their What would the grades look like for a really easy test? Distribution of the grades, class test. Last 
majority, and when does that go to peak? Roughly. 30 to 40,000. So most people earn well under 50,000. So income is always very, very skewed. Finally, the material counts elite samples. Well, this one might be a little bit counterintuitive, but if you take the if the health regulations are being respected, there's usually some upper bound beyond which you cannot have bacteria. So the number of packages with the bacterial count should be hopefully most of them down here. So it might be something like that. So if the company is cleaning their equipment properly, hopefully they're producing no product beyond that threshold, whatever that number. So that, I mean, and this was not sure, right? I don't have the data for this, but that might be my expectation. You might have another justification for that. So let's just uh, see what we've done here. In all those examples that you're thinking through, a histogram in your mind is a device that shows the long-term expectations for a variable. So what is the long-term expectation for a variable is what you're using. But let's take a look back at that dice example. We saw that a dice example had a uniform distribution. Does that distribution tell you what the value is the next throw that you're going to make? No. If I look at the batch yield data, let's say the batch yield data are normally distributed with a long term average of 160 plus or minus 20 grams per liter, it doesn't tell me what the next value of batch yield I'm going to get. So if I run my batch track tomorrow, can I predict what my yield is going to be? And we're going to create confidence in this problem. We're going to say where we <coughs> expect our value to lie, but again, a histogram can never tell you what the next value is. Uh, we can tell that Canada sex ratio at birth is 1.06 to 1. So 6% more boys and girls are born, but we cannot tell whether someone's next child is going to be a boy or girl. We can go look at life tables for females, for example. Females have 98.86% chance of reaching age 30 in Canada, and 77.5% chance of reaching age 75, but that doesn't tell you when you're going to die. Okay, so all that histograms do is they tell us historical long-term trends about now, we can just, an important point is, on the left over there, we, we, I've shown what we can call simply the histogram for the frequency distribution. And here I'm just showing random values, sent to zero as a frequency distribution. I use a thousand values to create that bar plot. And so, for example, the bar roughly at Zero, so that from the right of zero, there's 200 entries in each of those bars. Now, what I can go do is take those values and simply divide them through by capital A. So divide it through by 1,000, uh, for example, and I can plot those bars side by side. In the same way, and then just create what we call the normalized or relative frequency distribution. And what this allows you to do is if I do this in one variable, and I go do this again in another variable, and I go do it again on the third variable, now I can start to compare these plots to each other. Before when n is varying, I cannot compare them side by side. But we like to do create normalized distributions or relative frequency distributions. And there's another good reason why we like this, and this leads into Wednesday's topic, is that that area under the curve sums up to 1, and therefore fractions are proportional to the probability. So we'll take it from that point next time. We'll look at various